To my mind, there are seven fundamental positive purposes, and one of them is beauty. And it is the purpose that I use my entire life to serve. Um, the theater company that I have the pleasure of being artistic director of serves beauty. That is our purpose. Beauty is not the simple aesthetic elements of a painting or a well-crafted costume uh, or a beautiful piece of jewelry. Um, beauty lies in a lot of places. Uh, for example, as a director, the thing that I find most beautiful in life is a smooth transition. You know, if I can make a transition from chaos to peace so peacefully, so smoothly that you barely see it, well, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, if I can get the actors to understand that when there's a scene change, you don't race across the stage like you are in a hurry to go somewhere else, where else? You move across the stage beautifully and in, in it well, a, a good pace. Mm -hmm. um, you want to look always beautiful on stage and it has to do with what you project not necessarily what's happening in your face or whether or not you combed your hair today mm. that kind of thing um, there's beauty in a lot of things uh, uh, I find it beautiful uh, when the audience says I always feel at home here it's always good to come back to Ujima uh, I missed Ujima it's like coming home well that's beautiful so there's a lot to beauty uh, one of the key elements of beauty is peace. Another would be grace, you see. Um, another would be truth. So the, it depends on how you interpret beauty. Mm -hmm. But that's the purpose of my life. It's the purpose that my theater company serves. And uh, democracy, of course, is beautiful by definition, right? If it is, in fact, democracy, as opposed to this bastard child that we're living with uh, uh, in the United States, but um, so there's so there's beauty there as well. I don't mm -hmm. want to get ahead of myself with the questions, but but the purpose of my life is to serve beauty. You, whatever purpose you serve, you serve it till the day that you die. So, for example, um, why do I want the arts in every school? Why is it I believe every child should have an opportunity to engage the arts as he trains? Uh, certainly not because every child is going to be an artist, then we'd have too many artists and we can't <laughs> support the ones we've already right. got, right? So I'm not doing that. But in the process of studying art, uh, uh, a person learns self-discipline. Well, that's beautiful. A person learns uh, to work cooperatively with other people. A person learns what it means to be part of a team, even if no one ever uses the word team. Mm -hmm. uh, a person learns the value of putting others before yourself, because in the arts you have to do that all the time. Uh, if you're working collectively, hardly ever is it about you. It's always about us. Mm -hmm. Uh, even if you're playing the lead, it's still about us. I can play the part with tremendous excellence, but if the people around me are shady, then the play's no good. For sure. No one goes home and say, oh, I loved it. Lorna Hill was great. Right. You know, they go home and they say, my God, it was, you know, the continuity was off. The vibe was strange. I couldn't tell why she was in love with him. Blah, 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 blah. Right. Uh, beauty is when we're all on the same page. And we're all fully committed to the message of the art, you know. Right. Then it's beautiful. Right. I have a, I have a question. So, yeah. in in one of your plays, if there is kind of an ugly topic or ugly mm -hmm. content, in you know, in the play setting, it can become beautiful. I'm exactly. interested in that. Yeah. For example, when we did "Before It Hits Home," uh, that's a play about a man coming home to die. Uh, he has AIDS. He's at the full-blown stage. This is it for him. And he had left. He's a musician, and he works on the road, and uh, he has a relationship with a man in one place and a woman in another place, and no relationship with the mother of his child who is being raised by his parents. So the child doesn't have to move pillar to post with his father. So he returns to his home where his parents are raising his child, his mother has a very bad reaction. She can't stay in the house because a lot of people are like AIDS phobic. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that phobia is, uh, 
an issue in the African American community. But at any rate, the mother leaves home, she can't be there, and the father takes care of him until he dies. We see the father over him, sitting next to him uh, when he dies at the end of the play. Well, there's something ugly about dis-ease and uh, early death mm -hmm. and family schisms. All of this is ugly. Mm -hmm. But you tell the story with as much beauty, with as much grace as you possibly can. So to me, when I'm directing the play, at the center of the play for me is love. Now, love is beautiful all the time. I don't care who's mm -hmm. involved. Right. Right? So if I center everything around love, how people are uh, responding to love, uh, creating love, extracting love, running from love, running toward love, whatever, always keeping love at the center of the story for every actor in every scene. So when he goes to see his girlfriend and, and she has to open the door and he comes in, I've dressed her in lingerie, and I tell her, no matter what you say to him, the whole time you're talking to him, you, in your mind, you're thinking, I love you, I love you, I want you to love me. Let's go make love. Keep love in the front of your mind no matter what is happening in the conversation. There's all kinds of ways to do it. And you do it even when you create a moment where you deliberately intend to break the audience down, mm. right? You have to bring so much care into how you do that because you want them to stay with you. You don't want them to start moving against you right. when you break them down, you see? So there's a lot to think about, but if you do it with beauty, with love, and with grace, they're all crying at the curtain call, right. but they all loved it. Awesome. You know, that's, that's what it is. That sounds great, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, and then, so our next question is, can you think of a specific moment that kind of deepened your understanding of democracy or the lived out democracy in Buffalo? Well, of course, I'm, you know, 38 years into a uh, theater collective and our collective uh, was founded as a, you know, a democratic organization, right? One person, one vote. As artistic director, um, my, my vote is the same as anyone else's in, in the room. Um, if it's a 21-year-old member of the company or a 70-year-old member of the company, our voices all amount to the same. Um, uh, democracy, let me just back up for a second, because I know people also challenge deep democracy. Mm -hmm. So I want to make a distinction. Mm -hmm. There are times when you're practicing deep democracy and, some, and times when you're practicing democracy, like one person, one vote. Um, if you're running a business, you may not be able to go into deep democracy as often as you'd like to, okay? That's because for sure. for, That's for sure, yeah. right, for the obvious reasons. However, when you're actually creating the product, you can, be, you can use a lot of democracy. Uh, when I'm directing, there's a great deal that I have to know and tell them, but there's a great deal that they have to know and tell me and tell us. It's a continuing conversation. And, and as a director, I want to be sure that I don't dominate the conversation. The same thing that happens when we're in a meeting at a table and we have that rule of step up and step back and we keep begging people who never had to say anything to say something, right? right? Well, the same thing is happening in a rehearsal, you know. Um, when I am directing, I don't wish to be interrupted, but when I've, when I've given a direction, I welcome anything you have to say in response to it, especially if you can make me think about something I haven't thought of before. Now, if I give you a direction, I am not allowing for the democratic process where you decide whether or not to take my direction, okay? Because I'm trying to create a whole piece, and you're only one part of that. So if you don't take my direct direction, then the whole thing falls apart. But you take my direction, and if you don't like it, you tell me. But I'm uncomfortable doing this. I can't do it in these shoes. I can't do it if my mother's in the audience. You know, you, what, whatever your feeling is in response to the direction, I encourage you to, to give me that feedback because I might be able to make you comfortable. Anything I tell you to do, there's probably a hundred ways to do it. I only gave you one, right? So um, 
There's a lot of democracy in that process. Uh, uh, something as simple as if I come in and I brought in a yellow dress, now that maybe you wear yellow, but I would never deliberately put you in yellow on stage, but let's say I made that mistake. I brought in a beautiful yellow dress and you say, my God, yeah. I look terrible in <laughs> yeah. yellow. So I have Absolutely. to get another dress, you know. Um, at, uh, uh, at no point should you have the impression it's more about me and my comfort and my understanding than it is about you. I need you to fully understand what we're doing or it's just not going to work. So there's a lot of democracy in it. Um, of course, with the theater collective, you members also have an opportunity to weigh in on what plays we're going to do. So what we used to do, because we don't have a full season anymore, but we will when we move into School 77. Um, so at the annual meeting, we have an annual meeting, and at the annual meeting, we all make what we call affirmations. That means you go around the circle and every member affirms their commitment to the work that we're doing. Okay? Um, that sounds great. Uh, each wish, person... Which every organization could, you know, could yeah. have that opportunity. That's You've got to take that time. You only exactly. take it once a year. Right. But talk about how you feel about the work you did in the previous year. Um, what you are looking forward to contributing, contributing in the year upcoming, and just affirming your commitment because we try to function as an ideal family. Okay, so um, this is your opportunity to remind the family that you love them, how much you love them, and how much you're willing to sacrifice for them. Uh, and the other thing as the artistic director, uh, I would have in advance of that, or at that time, passed out the plays that I'm looking at doing the next year. And everyone that wants to is welcome to read them and give me feedback. And also tell me what you're going to do to make that play producible. So, for example, one year I passed out seven guitars, August Wilson. Um, Brother August was alive at the time. And it was also a stage in his career where he, uh, he required that you present him with a list of all personnel et cetera and so forth, because he had to approve your company doing his play. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, you couldn't just get it from his agent. I don't know what it's like now that he's gone, but that's what it was like at that particular moment in time. And I passed out seven guitars, and one of the members said, well, let's do seven guitars. Well, from the time that I passed it out until I heard um, him say, let's do seven guitars, I realized August Wilson, though, will have to approve. Even if he approves, mm -hmm. in the play, there are 12 live chickens. Well, I'm going to fake that. For sure. For sure, I'm faking <laughs> that. For sure. Okay. Wow. I'm faking that. But I don't know that I can fake it if it's August Wilson. Right. I don't want August Wilson to hear that I didn't use 12 live chickens. Right. So I said no, because I respect him. I respect his work. He put 12 live chickens in it. And you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, uh, someone else suggested a play and I passed it out. We all read it and someone else says, yes, let's do that play. And then I say, and um, how are we going to focus our marketing for that play? Because you have to know who you're selling the product to. And we couldn't figure out how we were going to focus the marketing. Let's put that one in the back burner. But you, you have that opportunity to say what you think. And maybe I know something you don't know, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, but weigh in. I'm not going to go in a back room and pick the plays and, you know. Right. Nah, why, why should I when I can get other people to help? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. That sounds great. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So that's a great great look in into the work. It's um, a little piece, yeah. That's awesome. Um, so the, okay, so the next question is, how can we make democracy more beautiful? Which has definitely been on my mind of late, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you know, in a democracy, we're not only allowed to, but we're encouraged to, and we all get to decide whether or not we will have children, mm. right? right? In a democratic society. We don't have, um, the government's not telling us two children per, per household or one, or, or no boys, or you can't have six, six girls or something like that. Um, we get to make these choices. But then we also have to go to work. And work doesn't allow you to bring your children. But we do need children. We're having a hard time carving out a place for children. 
we created this thing called a school system. That'll get rid of some of them for about six hours a day. But nobody's paying attention to the school system. It's very undemocratic, especially for children. So they're horribly undemocratic, especially for children. Um, besides, uh, besides not being very beautiful. Um, but even at that, so what, what can I do that's beautiful in a theater? How can I make democracy more beautiful? You got kids? Bring them to rehearsal. When we first started, I can never forget, I always took my, my child to rehearsal, but I can remember a sister coming into rehearsal and she was late and she had her child with her. And she said, I'm sorry, I'm late. I had a hard time getting out of the house. My husband said, he's not babysitting tonight. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> None of us had ever heard that before. It was a brand new concept, you know, that one of the parents could look at it as babysitting. But I did notice that that only happened when someone was trying to leave the child home with a man. Um, I didn't hear it from coming back from any wives or girlfriends. But at any rate, my response immediately was, well, you bring the baby with you. I bring mine. And everyone. So we made it a rule. We had to figure out the rules as we went along. Some things we knew up front. But this presented itself. Okay, bring the children. Consequently, if you came to a Ujima rehearsal, for ever after that, there are very likely to be children in space. And as we acquired more space, we were able to create space just for them. We were able to um, uh, fashion our dressing room so that it could also be a, a play space and have a TV with a VCR in it so they could watch, because in, you know, in the days that we had videotapes, that kind of a thing. Um, but they're a necessary part of us, and they are a result of choices that we are allowed to make. But once you make the choice, how do you live your life with the child in tow? Hmm. Uh, and we're not doing a good job with that. Um, that would make democracy more beautiful. Uh, if, if people didn't... If, if people didn't have to, once you exercise your right to do or have something in one space, as soon as you move out of that space, suddenly your choice becomes contentious. Mm. And that's how I see it with children. What are we going to do with the children? You know? And if your child does something bad in school or um, misses a detention or something, and now you have to go to school. You have to go and confront the authorities yeah. and try to get the road smooth back out for your child. But maybe you have a job that you can't take that time off from work without losing pay. Right, exactly. Um, so we could make democracy more beautiful if we would decide one of two things. Either we won't make parents come to school during the school day, we'll set up something on Saturdays where parents can come in and bail their kids out of jail, okay? Uh, or we find another way of parents dialoguing with us. Perhaps it could be a phone call. Perhaps it could be a Skype. Perhaps there's another way to do it. Uh, you see where I'm coming from on sure, that? absolutely. Definitely. Mm -hmm. All right, I, I think we'll leave it at that. Thank you so much. Oh, okay. Thank you, Lorna. That was amazing. And uh, we look forward to seeing everyone on October 5th at the Albright Knox at 6 p.m. for Beauty and Democracy, PPG's 10-year anniversary. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Awesome.